excavated sites like Pompeii and Herculaneum and the beauties of classical furniture. But Chippendale, a lowly craftsman, never had the opportunity to see such wonders and found himself out of step. If you do the Grand Tour as a professional, you're going to meet um, potential clients, other Englishmen, rich fellows on the Grand Tour. You will uh, see objects which will inspire you as a designer. And also you get yourself a pedigree, you know, you're more likely to be employed. The Scottish architect, Robert Adam, used his Grand Tour experiences to promote a fresh style which came to be known as neoclassicism. His designs were all about simple, straight lines and ancient decoration. And now everyone wanted Adam to redesign their homes. He was able to persuade the aristocracy, the gentry, to be able to um, update their taste to begin to dispose of all the fripperies of the Chinese and the French and the Gothic styles, uh, and actually to take on uh, the new classicism, which he was determined should now become the rule in, in Britain. He is the man of the moment. Everyone wants to get hold of Adam because he's the man who can produce the building with the, with the authentic feel of antiquity. But Adam wasn't a threat to Chippendale, he was his saviour. Adam realised a skilled cabinet maker like Chippendale could come in handy to furnish his interiors. It was a marriage of convenience, but together they would create the greatest houses of the 18th century. Harwood House, near York, is Chippendale and Adam's masterpiece. Thomas Chippendale threw himself into this commission, producing a magnificent array of furniture that took the St. Martin's Lane workshop a staggering 30 years to complete. He provided everything from the garden benches to the red curtains in the long gallery, which are all carved of wood. Harwood really was probably the most lavish furniture commission anywhere in Britain at this date. You know, it was even, even beyond really what the royal family were ordering. It was the opportunity for Chippendale to show really what he was capable of. It is one of the greatest palaces in Europe at this time. Ever the pragmatist, Chippendale embraced the restrained neoclassical style, achieving complete harmony with Adam's architecture. In the grand entrance hall, the classical motifs on the ceiling and on the walls are elegantly reflected on the chairs. The house belonged to the Lassels family, who'd grown wealthy through trade across the empire. And three centuries later, this is still the Lassels family home. I think with historic pieces like this, you admire them, you respect them, you look after them well. But we try to make the house and what's in it as alive as possible, not like a museum in which you're one side of things and the, the precious stuff is somewhere else over there at arm's length. 
the furniture in this room, the library, we were very used to. It's what you sat on and uh, try not to bounce up and down too vigorously on. This was, uh, and still is, very much a family room, still occasionally used for sort of family gatherings at Christmas. So, yeah, they're just used as a, as a suite of furniture in a room that you use. People sit, uh, kids climb on them, you know, you kind of try to stop people spilling sticky drinks onto them. You know, I mean, it, from that point of view, when this room is in full swing, it's used like any other room, like any other family in any other room. The showpiece of the house and of Chippendale's career is the Diana and Minerva commode. It's an elaborate neoclassical cabinet which depicts Diana, the Roman goddess of hunting, and appropriately, Minerva, goddess of craft. This imagery was created using the expensive technique of marquetry. Marquetry was a way of seamlessly piecing together thousands of tiny slivers of wood called veneers. Chippendale covered this mahogany cabinet with six different types of wood veneer including satin wood, tulip wood, purple heart, and ebony. The Diana and Minerva commode is one of the most astonishing pieces of furniture, not only in terms of its design, but also, of course, the quality of the craftsmanship. It's like a mini piece of architecture in a way, uh, with its pilasters, its frieze, and the cove in the center, uh, which suggests an arch and also the wonderful way that it curves at the side. That's, of course, intended so that the curtains can be drawn back uh, so they wouldn't be all ruched up. The wonderful use of the different timbers. If you look, for example, at the figures of Diana and of Minerva, Diana in particular, look at the shading which we have there on the ivory, which is offset against the ebony. It has wonderful details, which are uh, an astonishing thing to see. Jack Metcalf is one of the few people in Britain still practicing marquetry. He's been studying the commode for almost 10 years. Around about 1994, 95, we went to Herwood House and that just blew my mind away. I'd never seen anything as beautiful. And I realized then that I needed to study that work. Thomas Chippendale uh, was a superb designer first and foremost. His designs were far superior to any of his rivals. He was a hands-on man as well. Jack is now recreating elements of the Diana and Minerva commode using Chippendale's original techniques. Here you can see I've drawn the fan out on a template and what I want to do here now is start the first process of, of the artwork by making a dark line against one edge of this fan and using this hot sand. It's a technique that we call sand shading. This sand is silver sand. It has to be silver sand. It's a very gritty sand and because of that it will not stick to the veneer when I dip it in there. And you can see there how quickly it's just singed and burnt the edge. It will turn the effect as though the flutes of the fan look three-dimensional. So what I want to do now is to lay them onto this template, one piece at a time, um, using some veneer tape. In the 18th century, Chippendale would just have used a piece of paper with some animal glue brushed on with his finger. But all I do is lick this paper and hold it in place. I can then line the ruler up and cut through and that's the first flute installed. Mm -hmm. 
I've got all eight flutes now, and you can see there if I turn it over. You won't get the 3D image yet, but you can see where I'm trying to get some area of sand shading and darkening along the edge. And so now we, we need to um, produce what I call the scallops at the ends of each flute. I can draw around the template. And now what I want to do is to um, border it with a white veneer and then I'll fret saw the two at once uh, as I go around these scallops. This is a saw that we call a treadle saw and it's a replica of one that we think would have been used by Thomas Chippendale in the 18th century. And all it consists of is me using my foot on a treadle to pull down this rectangular frame which is made out of aluminium and above me there's a, a return lath of wood which it acts like a, a return spring and there we are and if we take off the fan discard the background because I don't need it there's the back of the fan already now sawn with its eight scallops. The method of cutting and sand shading is used all over the commode to stunning effect. And Jack's research has revealed something quite surprising. Rather than the now faded honeyed shades of brown we see today, each veneer would have been dyed with up to 15 different vibrant colours. You can see now that the fan has been laid onto the backboard and the rest of the motives have all been added as well. What we need to look at now is um, how this is transformed when uh, a polish is applied. Um, I haven't time to polish it but what I can do here is cover this cloth with some uh, neat alcohol and this will be the base for the French polish that will be going on. And, and here is where you see the transformation take place. And there you can see the change of colours. Harwood was the high point of Chippendale's career. But grand houses like this were to be his final undoing. Just like at Nostal, bills were left unpaid. Chippendale was owed the unprecedented sum of 10,000 pounds. He had paid for the labor and materials out of his own pocket, only to find, once again, that the Lord of the Manor was reluctant to pay up. In the 18th century, grand clients felt they didn't necessarily have to pay on the nail. And at Harwood, for example, it was 10 years before the first bill was actually paid, 7,000 uh, pounds, which was a huge amount of credit. And of course, it's always the case, the richest man in England has the best credit. So, of course, Chippendale had to put up with this. Harwood was to be Chippendale's last major project. He died in his early 60s. Chippendale left no money, just 28 pounds worth of furniture and a struggling workshop to his family. His grave, in sight of his workshop, in the St. Martin in the Fields churchyard, is now lost. It was built over trampled by other artistic titans under the National Gallery.